in isolation. It's an entire, it takes an ecosystem to make things happen. And um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get started. I'll, um, I will share my screen and let me know if you're able to uh, view it. Um. So I think we have a hand raised uh, by Vimal uh, Sutha. Do you want to say something, Vimal? Before we begin? Maybe not. Okay. So request you all to keep your mics on mute as I requested already. Uh, yeah. And uh, of course, you can keep your cameras on. That's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can't share it with others. Um, Parul, should we let everyone know that um, we'll have a small Q and A towards the end? So they could, I suppose, in the meantime, type in any questions or anything in the chat box and we can revisit them towards the end. Yes, That's absolutely. It. Absolutely. Please feel free to ch uh, type in the chat box your comments, your feedback, your queries, anything. We'd be happy to have an interactive session towards the end. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to an engaging session. Thanks. This will be about an hour long in case uh, you're wondering. Yeah. So, um, hi everyone, good morning. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks a lot, Parul, for uh, pushing for this. And it's always, um, whenever I have to, um, you know, put together a presentation like this, it's always a good chance for me as well to take stock of um, where I am with and um, what, what this means to me. Um, and what what agency this uh, this could provide uh, for the future? So um, I'm going to get started very uh, with some very um, with with well, what is lime? As most of you already know, it's a construction material. It's specifically used as a binder, which means that it can be mixed with a variety of aggregates and additives using a variety of techniques to create. Um, Concretes, plasters, mortars, um, and, and a whole host of finishes. Uh, and um, other comparable, um, by, no, well, not comparable, but other materials that, are, that play a similar role of a binder in construction are, for example, clay and, uh, of course, cement. So um, lime, has, uh, lime has been used as a binder for about the for, for centuries for for uh, for 7000 years across the world across geographies across contexts and um, lime is today viewed as a material of the past because in the 1950s uh, there was a wave and entirely we were uh, as cement took over the practice and lime became marginalized. Lime became viewed as a uh, is come to viewed come to be viewed as an outdated or an archaic material that belongs in the past. And um, like, like I said, it was used all over the world. And the same essential material, the same essential chemistry, the same essential minerals have generated this entire plethora of architecture in across contexts across uh, geographies, ac uh, across cultures. And um, I was very fortunate. So up, up here on the top left, what you see is, for example, uh, Roman aqueducts. And it is, it is believed that the Romans, uh, the, the Romans uh, technological revolution of combining lime with ash back in the day was uh, had a massive impact on how rapidly they could build infrastructure, cross water bodies, and um, expand their empire. And uh, so, so ideas like this, similar ideas, similar chemistries exist far closer home. For example, in Punjab as well, where uh, traditionally we've always used ash with lime. And, and I suppose uh, what I'm trying to say is that across the world. There are practices and very deeply developed, um, uh, deeply developed bodies of knowledge, and I was 
I've been very fortunate that um, since uh, the last uh, five years about, I've had the good fortune of um, living uh, in the Bichli Haveli, which is actually my ancestral home in Udaipur. It's been with our family. It, it was built by our family uh, you know, generations ago and all that. And I've been uh, very lucky because um, I've, soon after I completed my studies in uh, architecture, my family said I should you know, this house is sitting locked. It's a beautiful house. Why don't you try and um, restore it and introduce modern amenity and bring it back to life? So um, what happened as a result? So I, I, had, I didn't have any formal experience of conservation or neither like education masters nor, um, you know, work experience. But I knew instinctively, I knew that in order to, uh, take up take up this project. I would first have to learn this building because it was completely unlike any kind of building I had seen growing up in Delhi, where we lived in a apartment, a, a developer built apartment. The entire architecture and urbanism that I had uh, I had become used to through years of college, through year through you know internships and through my own life experience were completely removed from this other world that uh, I found myself immersed in when I came to the Bichli Haveli. And um, slowly, over a period of a few years, what I started, what I was effectively doing was experiencing lime as a material. And I was living constantly and seeing across the day, across the seasons, across spaces, across architectural configurations and spatial configurations. Uh, how this material plays out. So my um, my faith and my relationship in this material happened very slowly and over uh, very organically as well. And uh, I was sort of in absolute isolation actually out here. The um, you know I was surrounded by karigars, you know artisans from the village. Uh, not always the highest. Skilled, uh, you know, the kind of master craftsmen who are very hard to access in my, you know, in my little, in whatever experience I've had. Uh, what I had was also I, I lived um, in, the, in the heart of the old city. I live in the heart of the old city here. I'm surrounded by uh, medieval buildings of different um, uh, purposes and scales, whether it's small workshops, which are humble dwellings. Again, using similar material ecosystem, but different techniques. And then larger scale buildings all the way up to like celebrated palatial buildings like the city palace. So um, I was ex this, this is how I was uh, educating myself. Um, these are a few images of the, the definitely the more flattering images of the house and uh, that I live in and that I am in right at this present moment. And it's... I think it's turned into my laboratory and um, certain ideas, certain uh, awarenesses that have been triggered triggered by living here. Uh, I continue to explore them and I hope to, um, I, I, I get all my ideas for uh, what I do currently, which is M-Lime. Um, and I'll come to that uh, at, at a later point in the presentation in more detail. Um, spring entirely from this building and responding as intuitively as I can to uh, to its fabric and uh, its behavior and its uh, and its entire system of floorings, walls, structure uh, and architecture. So it became clear to me uh, as I started uh, experiencing this lime habitat and also uh, just observing the building because over the years of course there were small quick repairs and patchworks and even slightly deeper repairs conducted with cement which which temporarily which which bought us time but i could see that they were coming apart i could see that lime and uh, that cement would not be the right choice or uh, of material for a long-term durable restoration of this project um Simultaneously, I was living in this lime habitat, and uh, as as many of you would have experienced, there's not a lot of literature uh, in the mainstream that talks about lime. So I was, um, in fact, reading more about people, other people's experiences living in havelis, and all of that very limited. I actually uh, found myself having to rely mostly on my own 
first-hand experience which made my entire process and project and discovery far slower but I think uh, it's therefore maybe sunk in a bit more deeper uh, but anyway so I, I also slowly started realizing that lime can be much more than a restoration material and I want to uh, explain that to you I want to share certain um, key uh, pivotal um, uh, sort of discoveries some was very slow over a period of years and uh, some were like eureka moments but th this is what i experienced in the first two three years of uh, living in and out of the bichli haveli and um, I, I want to share a few of these anecdotes because uh, um, they they uh, will sort of they will they will uh, they, they sort of crystallize um, how i see lime and the properties of lime, the behavior of lime, and the entire logic of this material, of how this material performs. So uh, one of them is a, a word that everybody's always heard of when it comes to lime is breathability. And it's an extremely abstract concept because you really can't see a wall breathe. You can you can't, you know, uh, you can't see uh, air pass through a lime plaster as opposed to, say, an impervious material like cement. Uh, one can't really visually see it. However, while living in this building, I, um, when I first start, when I first moved into this building, um, we have two courtyards, and uh, the more private courtyard, which was the kitchen area. Around it, there were about eight rooms, and all of these rooms were so full of seepage. And what you see here is just a typical room full of seepage and uh, so damp that even in the middle of Rajasthan, hot summer, one could smell the mold. And that's not only unhealthy for the inhabitant, it's also completely unhealthy for the structure of the building because essentially it means your masonry units are wet and they are melting. And... Um, of course, as a habitat, it's unlivable. It's not even usable as a storage room. So uh, this was this was a big challenge for me because it made me nervous about any other, um, you know, uh, restorations that I may take up in the project. I, I I always felt nervous that I wouldn't know how to control this. I, I was at the mercy of, uh, you know, when when damp would happen any kind of the the source of the leak the source of the damp could be very close or very far to my property i cannot control the building edges so i always felt nervous that even the rooms that are dry would at some point in the next 20 30 years become damp and i'd not have any control over it and um um this this kind of this really gripped me. I got a lot of waterproofing consultants to suggest ideas. There were a lot of ideas for chemical injections, all very costly as well. These are two feet wide, typical Haveli walls built of masonry uh, or with the local uh, stone. And uh, to, in, to, to think of introducing a damp proof course at this stage sounded very absurd to me. And even the waterproofers were trying to offer the best that they could. But uh, they were expensive and uh, solutions that were not at all, uh, you know, going to guarantee any any um, success. Uh, you know, that, so so from this place where we were literally thinking of using underfloor heating in the middle of Rajasthan, um, I, I I sort of slept on this problem, and then slowly over. Oh, about six months later, I had a penny drop moment, and I'm sorry for the quality of these images, but what you see here is that the, all the floors on these ground floor rooms were clad with um, black uh, chitor stone, which is a kind of uh, limestone. It's, it's, a, um, it's a fairly impervious sand, limestone. It's not like breathable sandstones, which are also breathable to a very limited extent as far as stones go right but uh, so so uh, all of these rooms were clad with flooring which was a new concept in the 1950s it was a, it was a new idea to take stone and cut it into thin slabs and use it as cladding up until then as you can see uh, in you know stone was a structural material it was always used 4 to 6 inches deep and um, uh, it's used as a cladding was a new idea and and in uh, so going with the fashion of the times my great grandfather had kind of laid out this flooring in all of the rooms 
And I realized that this is the reason why moisture is accumulating. All I had to do is over a period of a couple of days, remove all of this flooring. We collected it in a heap in the courtyard. And um, slowly but surely over a period of one month, the entire building dried up because the floors started, the floors were opened up, the original um, uh, uh, floors were revealed and vapor was passing through that and it prevented the accumulation of damp within the walls. And this was crazy magic moment for me. I mean, you can imagine this was one of the first things I'd say I accomplished in the project, even though it needed so little doing actual construction work was hardly anything here. but. What it told me and what it immediately showed me is that I need to show faith in the material, which is a line, which is what this building is made of. And I need to let it do its thing. And I don't, I shouldn't um, come in with my sort of conditioning and the kind of building construction sections and external wall sections I have learned in college and in internships. I shouldn't bring that over here. I need to sort of uh, give this material a chance and allow it to do its own, allow it to play out its own behavior. So with lime, it is in barriers that keep the moisture out. It is allowing ventilation. So if you have an old house and you have just and you can't maintain it, do one thing is the one thing you can do for it is just open up the doors, windows, let the air pass as much as you can and allow opportunities for breathability. Don't let the seepage literally melt and marinate the building. So uh, breathability was one of my first. Uh, 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 so so this was this, so this is slowly how I began to find faith in the material. And um, then there were smaller nuances of everyday life that I started observing. For example, uh, I live in an old city. The Haveli is obviously in the middle of the old wall city in in the absolute dense center, we have open drains. I live practically on a construction site and we have heaps of rubble. And yet I would always experience very few mosquitoes uh, compared to like my parents' house in Delhi, which has airtight windows and whatnot. So um, again, very recently I read the uh, read in, in a certain uh, research, I think it was conducted in Japan, uh, that um, the reason for that could be that mosquitoes Lime walls, lime surfaces do not allow mosquitoes to lay eggs. So, um, you know, behind paintings and things where in Delhi or, or well, De by Delhi, I mean, well, uh, other buildings of non lime materials, these um, mosquitoes will breed and accumulate and um, will not happen in a lime building. The other, the other concept which was totally um, different to the one that I was conditioned to was of appropriate strength as opposed to high strength. So now we have engineers, a structural engineer, civil engineers who are all involved on our construct, collaborate with architects. And the goal with every material and every specification is always to maximize strength. However, working in the Haveli, where I had to, uh, I, I realized that what we instead need is appropriate strength, which means that very simply, the plaster should never be stronger than the masonry unit because a building is designed to fail in a certain sequence, which is that you want the finishes to fail first, the plaster, which is a protective covering for the masonry to fail second. After that, you want the mortar to fail and only then the masonry units. And actually, similar logic is used in structural engineering, where you always make in RCC the slabs uh, weaker than the um, than the you know the, uh, uh, the the beams, and then the columns. So the columns will fail last, and you want necessarily the flat slabs to fail first in case of a you know excessive uh, stress. So, um, but but these ideas. Uh, made me rethink lime and made me rethink what is strength. Strength isn't always just about highest compressive strength. Strength is also about durability and about the way it works in conjunction with other materials. Again, in different regions, if you have different masonry units, then that logic again has to be worked out for that particular context, ideally. And, and one can see it contained in traditional buildings quite um, 
uh, you know, can see quite obviously in uh, traditional buildings. And uh, so apart from that thermal acoustic regulation, all of this is something I started experiencing slowly. There was a, when I just moved into this building, I used to have these little uh, temperature, you know, machines that I got from, uh, you know, Amazon, simple ones, and I would, uh, and humidity machines, and I would go about um, recording hourly measurements all through the night even, and driving everybody a little mad, um, trying to understand how uh, lime works with temperature, because at around 9 p.m. every night, I have a roof above my bedroom, I would feel this, uh, I would feel as if the building is radiating heat, and from 9 to 10 p.m., I didn't like being in the room at all. And I could appreciate why everybody used to sleep on the roof back in the day. And, um, and, and I realized that basically we have lime concrete uh, flat roofs. And I, I could now start correlating the depth of those flat roofs because they vary across the building uh, with, with their kind of ability to, uh, to, have, to behave as a thermal buffer. I could also slowly, uh, slowly I started developing an understanding of material and architecture and how they work hand in hand, spatial uh, configurations. So um, uh, apart from this, of course, I was trying to read whatever I could bring, uh, lay my hands on. And um, uh, this is something that most of you are probably already very familiar with, which is that unlike, uh, say, cement, lime is easily recyclable it is so easily recyclable that when supposing we have a you know we have a deep crack a settlement crack which is also cracked up uh, a flat roof terrace and we want to patch up this crack so we of course take out all the loose debris al along the crack of and this is debris of lime concrete we take all of that lime concrete crush it up and add it in our new mix as we fill the crack because that is exactly how recyclable and circular and how much life lime has in it. So a 150 year old building like this one is a young lime building and a lime building is going to last you for 500 years without question if you keep it the right way and allow it to behave in the way it needs to and sort of judge it on its own terms. Um, so, uh, so I... Uh, I started realizing all these amazing values that were embedded in this material at a time when the entire world was waking up with, you know, new consciousness in every sphere of life, whether it's food or uh, any kind of uh, product that we consume, people want organic. We're thinking about environmental Im impacts. We're thinking about how much chemical are we living with and uh, what is natural, defining what is natural because um th that's another so all this is this is kind of this was the environment this is this is now absolutely the trend and uh, five years ago these things had started uh these kind of consciousness um awarenesses had started waking up and uh, so what you see here as a set of chemical formulas really and uh, uh, this really describes the same chemistry whether it happens in a haveli in rajasthan or uh, you know, Mor old Mor Morocco or a Venetian palace or, or Japanese, uh, you know, plasters. Uh, lime uh, has this, uh, lime is everywhere a sustainable and easily recyclable material. And in an age of accumulating landfills and very, very rapid construction where we build and break, build and break constantly as bylaws change, uh, this starts making more and more sense and uh, more and more uh, relevant um but for me i c come back to uh, i still needed to restore this building as lovely as it was in lime and as a, as beautiful as this material was and uh, i still found the everyday life of being an architect on site trying to get work done in lime highly frustrating and infuriating and um, I felt completely at sea because I could see all of this knowledge so close to me standing and manifesting in buildings and yet I couldn't I felt I couldn't access it uh, um, now for example th these are some of the possible aggregates and additives that one can use with lime across regions in in Therefore, actually, in Mewari, they say that every 40 villages, the traditional recipe of lime changes. And uh, it was uh, 
still very difficult for me to now the world is a much smaller place than the 40 village you know that, than that so when the context is completely changed the uh, appropriation of knowledge also becomes a little bit harder so i want to um uh, so, so like for example again these are additives that are used with line work some of them across from across the world um and what i uh, what i struggled with is to rationalize all of these place specific forms and figure out what i need in my building because um and i'll explain that a little bit more why i struggled um also uh, uh, this idea of lime traditional practice being extremely hyper local is also something that i felt was not always correct because in my own roof above here i observed which is you know you see a photo on the left we have lime concrete flat roof i found pieces of seashell and you can imagine that there is no seashell in the locality of udaipur so uh, and and then uh, recently i read that even the timber that is being used in all the vernacular buildings of gujarat for earthquake proofing them all the tie beams and all of that came from kerala so um, I, I question what is local. I question some of the romantic ideas that we may have about traditional uh, buildings and traditional building ecosystems. And um, while so, and and while there is a wealth of uh, knowledge that one could see, which has become very a very complex body of knowledge, uh, when one refers to things like IS codes as as an architect today, my tools were you know IS codes re and um, specifications and field manuals and of course karigars who my who were around me and accessible to me and i found reading them i found a lot of confusion a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of the lack of rationalization a lot of um, uh, dependence on local language which we hadn't yet man managed to in all these years of the world becoming a smaller place managed to uh, kind of uh, build bridges between and I'll show you a few more examples of this uh, sh uh, in a sh short bit But there were times when the IS code would say things that were completely factually not correct and Completely different to whatever I was seeing and experiencing on ground with my absolutely local teams and uh, so, so let me give you a snapshot of my life on site which i'm sure a lot of you will be able to relate to this is pretty much the practice of using non-hydraulic lime there's many, there's a few different types of lime and um i in this region and what we work with at mlime as well is largely non-hydraulic lime so uh, the the essential steps of the process the broad steps remain actually more or less principally unchanged the same chemistry that was played out 300 years ago plays out even today on uh, sites that choose to use lime so raw material is lime mined from nature in the form of limestone we then feed this into a kiln we it's not done on site feed kilns are usually not built on site so somewhere in a country kiln and you get white rocks like this that come out of the kiln which are called quick lime and another word uh, sorry that uh, familiar i'm sure familiar to most many of you the quick lime is then brought to site and we build slaking tanks such as these where we plunge this quick lime into water and what you see is a huge amount of steam or exothermic reaction uh, that happens and um, as this cools what is created is a lime putty and this lime putty is the actual usable binder ideally it should be sieved grinded and aged before before mixing creating mixes and using it so this uh, non hydraulic lime putty which is the actual binder now if you were to think of the equivalence uh, it's like bringing cement clinkers to site and processing cement on site which is very absurd today to, to think about it like that uh, but basically the standard practice has been to process these materials on site and bring them to site only in a semi-processed form and we were also in our own kind of uh, diy whatever we could put together with whatever resources and knowledge that i had around me we managed to do something which was uh, very very frankly ordinary we got reasonably all right lime it was a, a young lime and let me let me uh, 
show you what I saw were the gaps in this process. From this same process, which was broadly what was followed traditionally 200, 300, 100 years ago, um, at every step, I was asking questions for which I didn't have very good answers. Is the raw material well graded? Because what I'm getting from the markets is something is white rocks. So when the, these white, there's no specification. What was the temperature inside the kiln? What are the burnt and underburnt, overburnt, underburnt impurities? How long has this quick line been sitting in the corner market before it's come to my side? Because as long as it's sitting and catching, uh, uh, you know, catching, it's carbonating from the air, that's creating, that's breeding impurity into my binder. And uh, immense amount of uh, manual menial work and therefore management work as well was created on site because of all these processing steps that one had to take up on site also created a huge space hassle and um, they say when Rome's, romans built uh, rome they, they aged their line for three years when the city palace was built they aged their line for two years for me the best possible at a stretch i could probably do three months so and then I saw the unfortunate alternative of powdered lime, which had become, which has sort of taken over a lot of lime practice in the country, which is just sad because outside of our country, I mean, in the Europe, nobody would ever use hydrate, you know, hydrated lime for anything more than a whitewash. So um, again, it's a dry form of lime and uh, any uh, dry form of non-hydraulic lime is constantly catching air. It has surface. In fact, if it's a powder, it's catching even more air because it has more um, surface area. And when I say catching air, I mean it is carbonating before it's hit your wall, which is not what you want. It's effectively sit setting in the bag. It's effectively transporting wet cement. We always buy it. We make sure, we go out of our way to make sure that cement is kept dry for that reason, right? So, so, um, what I basically found is that the entire ecosystem and all the various actors, supply chains, uh, time, workers, marketplace, all of that was crumbling. And while there were a few new contemporary actors that had come into this, uh, uh, had sort of woven themselves into uh, our construction processes today, uh, as far as lime goes, um, the, the people, practice, infrastructure, technology, all of it, they were, uh, they, they, was, they, they were crumbling. And the effect of that was that I was left with poor quality material, uncertain quality material, which is even sometimes worse than poor, because no specifications, no, none of the tools that I'm used to using as an architect uh, to, to audit work happening on site. Um, I also, like I was uh, talking about IS codes, I found it extremely hard uh, for them to be helpful because uh, the, there was simply no rationalization of language. And even um, slowly and sh slowly I realized as I read that uh, certain words and the use of certain words was very confusing. And it took a lot of sort of self-teaching to be able to break through all that uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, tangle of vocabulary. And and part of this is, I'm sharing this is because I guess somebody's just got to sit and streamline it and bring what is essentially a craft practice into and convert it into a construction practice. Um, I, I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit more shortly and just seeing how I'm doing for time. Okay. So, um, I, I realize that all limes are not equal. I realize that the word impurity is not always bad because, again, these kind of uh, views such as purity and impurity are actually now shaped by um, chemical and mineral industries who are some of the biggest users of lime today. And what they view as an impurity in construction is uh, is not a negative thing. It's, it's something that we want our sort of, uh, for example, are not naturally hydraulic limes to have. So there's a, a lot of detail like that in which, uh, which, which is not ironed out, which is not clear, which is not straightforward, and turns using lime into a lifetime research project, which is really unfortunate and discouraging. I found details in the IS codes. I started looking at uh, you know these kind of diagrams a lot because they started telling me why 
what happened that everyone suddenly decided lime is the worst material with no promise and let's all do cement and i started seeing some details which were Malvika, you you're on mute somehow. You're on mute. Just you just went mute a few seconds back. When you were talking about the detail, you went mute. Um, Pavel ma'am, if you're the organizer, I think you can unmute her. So, Balvika, I think the bottom band, there would be the unmute button. I think she will be joining again. Yeah. She's still on mute. Right, got you. Yeah. Does this work? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. I'm just going to reshare my uh, screen. Right, so uh, I was just uh, sharing that um, there were details like this, which were um, the go-to details in, in the 90s and the 80s. And of course, details like this, today we understand very easily, are designed to fail, where cement concrete is being used to um, you know, pack uh, and grout uh, rainwater drains in a lime concrete terracing. So this, these were the transition period details as the, as the construction moved from uh, you know, lime to cement. And um, these kind of composite details were created, which uh, at the time probably, uh, you know, based which would probably, uh, you know, now we realize would set up to fail, were, would such a detail would fail even with the best quality lime and craftsmanship. Right. So um, and actually, uh, there's lot lots more like this in the IS codes that you can see. And, uh, you know, even I started looking at looking for tender documents wherever I could. And I realized that even though they had bothered to write a few ratios down, but when you say one slaked lime, it has no meaning because there is no definition of slaked lime. Huh. At the very basic, uh, uh, you know, at the very basic uh, baseline, what is how much water content is there in the lime and let alone the purity and the profile and the, uh, you know, the kind of lime. So uh, if you compare this to a specification for any kind of cement mortar, for example, you're going to roll, you can, you can very quickly see that these specifications are quite unspecific and therefore not helpful. And uh, in the end, then anything goes on site. And we don't, uh, uh, you know, contemporary practice really suffers. So, so where we stand presently, where we stood, especially where I stood in 20, up, up until halfway of 2019, uh, until early 2019, was that I could see how uh, there was the promises of cement, which was that it was extremely rapid construction and at a time, uh, you know, quicker setting times and quicker work working times on site so much more streamlined and i could see how over time defective practice had led to a loss of faith in the material and when you start losing then when patronage is lost then everything suffers every chain in the ecosystem suffers the supply chain the uh, the artisanship the specification the policy everything suffers and what had happened is that in a country like india where we are entirely dependent on the oral tradition for the transfer of knowledge uh, we had had a break of more than three generations now today as as we stand and uh, three generations and which means that 
the best of the car carigars that i found the oldest ones had a vague memory of their in their you know childhood when they with their grandfathers did a bit of lime concrete here or there so uh, again not very reliable sources of information a memory which is 50 years old is not a very good memory to 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 count uh, you know to count on and uh, the long and short of it is that i start i I felt, how should I restore this project? All of these problems stand, but still I have to complete this building, complete this uh, restoration project. And it also started triggering thinking inside me that why why are we here today? And I, I started thinking about simple things like the relationship of real estate to construction, which has completely changed the way we build. And one of that is that when the Haveli, for example, when this Haveli was built, the cost of real estate was very less. And the cost of construction was very high. Now this relationship of cost of construction to real estate has inverted. So real estate is very expensive. Time is very expensive. And construction is just a marginal percentage of, of the cost of real estate, actually, of land. And then there's urbanization, constant changing of policy, constant densification that one um, uh, th that one desires, especially in dense city centers, big city centers, metropolises, where which take up the bulk of construction across the world. So um, these changes in value system, of course, inform uh, the very material choices that we make as, as you know, as as uh, as, uh, as as a world. Um, and while I was getting frustrated with practice, I was equally getting fascinated with Lyme. My experiences by this time, I had lived about three, four, three and a half years in this building on and off. And I was discovering more and more. And the more I allowed Lyme to do be itself, the more reward it gave me and more simplified my own restoration plans became. Um, like I said that um, we live, we're living in a world where of course, our material choices have deep consequences. We're almost at a crisis point reflected in every aspect of, uh, of, of life. And um, we need to, this is, this is that our generation, especially for me, like as an architect, when you come out of school, you want to know how do you, you want to know your place in the world. You want to know how you can fit in, how you can affect, how, how you can be part and partake in, in something meaningful and positive. And um, at the same time, it's about 60, 80 years now of cement, 60 years of cement construction. We can see, we can now see cement coming full circle. We can see the flaws with it, the unsolvable problems or the problems that haven't been solved with it yet. We can see it's an extremely hard to repair material with a very limited lifespan. For example, Frank Lloyd Wright's, Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, which is, which was an, it is an iconic building in architectural history and cultural history and um, is today falling apart and it's very, very hard and expensive to save it because uh, cement as its life as as time passes its life shortens and there's nothing that one can do to fight that essential um, essential life cycle of cement and um, you know so when one so this is I feel this is the time and everyone's really thinking about their choices and analyzing them with very great detail, very closely. And I felt Lime was already checking so many of these boxes. So why is it so marginalized? And I could tell because of my own site experiences why it is, right? Um, the ecosystem around it was absolutely breaking down. The knowledge system was sort of, uh, you know, there but not there and not accessible. And I felt that uh, this super relevant material uh, it wasn't just about my project anymore, but I now wanted to share my sort of discoveries with everybody else. And so uh, with a lot of uh, sort of good luck, um, I was fortunate enough to make our first batch of lime, uh, high quality, ready to use, uh, very pure, very controlled production from scratch, from limestone um, in... Um, 2019 in, in around April 2019 and then I was very fortunate to have Velour Institute of Technology a visiting team from there they took some of that first test batch of mine literally one little drum they took some of it back and they um, 
tested it and they gave me the thumbs up that uh, you know malika this has promise go ahead and start using it in your project and uh, slowly and sh surely um this completely changed the headache factor on site it i finally had confidence i could start engaging with far more workers who were, had not worked with lime before even something as simple as making a mix of lime earlier needed um, you know an old seasoned uh, lady who who had been mixing lime for her whole life before she could uh, work with the, you know and uh, with m lime now we had consistency we had predictability every bag was similar in nature so we could use ratios in a very meaningful way to streamline our management on site and so on and uh, in corona shortly like uh, recently sorry i set it up as an independent enterprise because i realized uh, it was helping me and a few sites had sort of taken it from me uh, informally and then i realized that this has potential to to do more and this could be my route to um sort of being connected with far more sites than i would be as an architect um and um you know and and probably impact one their material choices and hope um uh, and and also at uh at, at a larger scale for me m lime became a way to do capacity building across the country we've just taken the small smallest earliest micro steps but for me that means that we have a small crew that goes around to uh, our customer sites and trains the local crew which has usually never worked with lime before in a 3 to 5 day on site workshop the, so our crew works hand in hand with the local crew and trains them in lime based techniques which is possible when your binder is ready to use when you streamline the process and when when we understand the chemistry enough to pick what we want from the traditional practice and remove what we feel is uh, uh, you know n not uh, and, and remove where, where we can select and reject what we want to keep from the traditional practice and where we can extract the essence of the traditional practice uh, and uh, continue to allow the material to be the best form of itself so um, i feel like having ready to use materials is one big part of it because that entire menial and expensive and uncertain processing of raw material is now you know no longer something we need to do and uh, sort of bring the knowledge for or the resources for resources being time money effort all of that so uh, i'm also i'm i'm happy about our uh, crew training program that we recently started because in my own way we're now we've got small small crews Uh, you know in different parts of the country now that know how to work with lime that will not feel afraid of the material or think that it's an archaic material and so on and uh, everything from mortars plasters concrete finishes all of that is uh, you know that that those techniques are shared um, with the local crews on these kind of workshops um so i i realized i mean of course my own project is still here and it's still my laboratory and it's still going on and i think it'll uh, it, it, it'll go on to the end of my life but i realized um I, all the ideas i take from here i want to now focus on scalability just because like i said the the scale of crisis we are at as as, as a world we need scalable implementable solutions and um, not just bespoke artisanal solutions uh, always um and and that's what so how do we take lime from from its traditional form as a bespoke craft to a repeatable predictable complex construction practice rapid that can be scale replicated and uh, you know uh, basically i want to fit lime into the cement mindset as a natural chemical free recyclable sustainable alternative and so i started looking around shopping for ideas always always a good idea to um, do that and i saw that in the uk us and europe for example especially um, they they were already creating these ready to use products in which they embedded a lot of the knowledge a lot of the place specific forms of lime practice were rationalized however the entire bulk uh, the, the bulk of the uk us europe lime practice is focused on restoration it is not really seeing it as a contemporary material except for finishes and 
uh, that is something where I deferred and I looked still further around. And this is a little case study that I'm going to share very quickly. I know we're almost at the end of our time. Um, it's not really a case study, but just one of the examples of a traditional material that has been completely reinvented to fit in our value system meaningfully today, and that's timber. So not timber buildings, which this is how we looked at timber frame structures, and this is the kind of inherited wisdom of timber construction, has now become this, where these are high-rise buildings, and this is something um, happening in the last decade only. And and uh, it's only over a decade of collaboration that we have now created this entire uh, concept of mass timber construction and all the European and American city centers, Canadian city centers, all have now high rise timber constructions where they are structurally made of timber. And all those issues regarding fire safety and durability are gradually being resolved. And I again, I feel Lime fits right in. Lime has the same starting the seed of the idea is the same that it's a natural material, it's a recyclable material. And then it's a matter of how far our vision takes us, our research, our collaboration. And uh, that can that can then, you know, affect in industry, it can affect supply chains, it can affect policy, there are innovators, there are visionaries, all of them have come together to make this kind of thing the new normal now in to, 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 to just sort of expect these kind of uh, structures where you have wood and very minimum, almost no steel. And uh, um, uh, so, so uh, I, I liked the whole kind of, uh, you, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have already seen and heard about these timber buildings, but what I love about them is that um, is that a lot. It's it's an extremely and highly collaborative effort, where everything from the planting of the tree down to the constr uh, you know fire and safety sa standards and everything in between has been resolved at a kind of you know continental scale, and it is only possible by through very high levels of energy collaboration and focused, um, you know, and focus. And, and I think that's because there's an urgency that everybody, there's an urgency that everyone senses with respect to the environment and material choices. And uh, I mean, and, uh, and, and these, these awarenesses start in, in universities and in places, you know, every university is, is, is potentially a hotbed of where these ideas can start. Um, for example, ETH now in Switzerland um, teaches cement only in the history of architecture. And uh, Parsons uh, in New York has uh, this really lovely um, sustainable materials laboratory. And there's so many programs which are just energy and sustainability um, based. So um, for me, the future of Lime and hopefully M-Lime can be a tiny part of that as well, uh, will be um, about taking appropriating the knowledge we already have so far, which is an immense body of knowledge, and using that to revitalize this coming century of building and construction. And in order to do that, we need to reinforce the, the supporting ecosystem, which means supply chains, regulatory, regulatory systems, which is absolutely one of key, especially as it stands today, because we have no basic even specifications to re regulate our practices today. Um, we, need, we need more investigations on uh, terms and parameters that we value to that we that we understand today in the format that we understand today uh, not uh, uh, you know uh, not just uh, sort of uh, organic and informal uh, understandings but harder quantifications of every parameter and even therefore creating the list of these parameters becomes very important and very uh, an exercise in itself where one has to deeply understand lime rather than just again uh, sort of going on autopilot taking parameters from cement and trying to kind of stick lime into it even something as simple as uh, you know green building certifications need to rethink their parameters to be more 
open minded and include more materials like lime and equivalent which don't necessarily we shouldn't be judged on the same parameters as cement and steel and uh, so so there's a you know a whole there's also entrepreneurs contractors developers actual patrons uh, all of whom need to kind of be brought into the fold and um, hopefully policy level changes will make um, will will make uh, will give us an interesting future and a beautiful future with uh, possibly with lime in it thank you so much thank you so much for listening and i um, i hope that was enjoyable <laughs> and do let me know um if there's any questions that i can take up yes i think there are lots of questions valvika so uh, thanks first of all i think uh, i'm so glad to see uh, you know such a frank presentation of the actual practical challenges of uh, you know working with a material you know integrally and uh, it's it's uh, i think uh, we are probably a lot of us are asking these questions but to you for, for you to take these questions head on and actually get into you know finding the answers is fantastic so yeah thanks thanks for that i think very very pertinent questions that you are trying to bring up you know for the field and for the future of lime certainly so now uh, i think we'll uh, start with some of the questions uh, that have yeah. come up over here um so tanvi uh, has asked tanvi you want to ask yourself yeah please go ahead if you there yeah so am i audible yes okay uh hi malvika so great presentation thank um, you very 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 insightful uh the students of ia have been studying lime for the past two classes in their traditional materials and techniques class this semester so this is a very very relevant webinar and uh, you know session for them um one question that i'm constantly asked is that is lime a redundant material in today's construction or does it still have a potential for being you know like a major construction material for all the sort of buildings that are coming up so, i think uh, sorry yeah go on sorry sorry, yeah, sorry so on. like you know um, earlier on lime was used for havelis and you know single block monolithic buildings but uh, we've also kind of researched that some of the modern buildings also use lime in various different capacities so the kind of high rises and the buildings uh, you know like commercial buildings that are coming up do you think lime is still relevant for those buildings absolutely and i think that's why i um i um shared that little kind of snippet about timber which was a kind of complete right. diversion from lime but it was just to demonstrate that you know from a swiss cottage timber frame swiss cottage or a kerala uh, uh, you know kerala house it makes the jump to a high rise and these are real buildings that are actually built and they're actually being used so i feel like it needs research it needs collaboration it right. needs agency that i don't have as an individual but already in my limited agency as an individual i i can already see in a year year two years of working with lime and m lime i can see how how much scope there is to make to bring lime into contemporary times and then further into propel it into the future and inform the next decade and the next century of construction so i absolutely think it's possible and i think mm -hmm. in our own little way we're also doing it like most of our customers are actually new build projects mm -hmm. right i hope that answers your question it does it does thank you so it, i mean it definitely tells us that there's a great potential and yeah. uh, the students and the budding architects can definitely take it forward if they are interested in the material rather than just picking the microwave quick fix cement option yeah and <laughs> um, and frankly it's uh, now we know where cement falls short as well like very recently now i've been providing lime to uh, cement based constructions 20 year old 15 year old constructions where um, they have excessive problem of seepage because yeah. once you have a leaking pipe no amount of waterproofing is going to kind of hold it in and yeah. so we have there was literally a toilet where the tiles are falling off and it was an architect's office because that was the extent of seepage from the common building plumbing stack and we're now using a uh, lime we we provided lime plaster all over that building and it's all over that toilet and mm -hmm. it's doing really well so far 
so uh, there's a lot i think there's a lot to take forward in this line of thought and the more i am engaging with people actually the, the projects the more ideas i'm getting as well and i'm sure i can see even that how that's so scalable like if everybody got together and really focused on uh, you know making something happen it does get done right thank you so much <laughs> I think that right. so uh, I think uh, Professor Bhavna Danduna had raised her hand. Uh, uh, would you like to ask something, Bhavna? Uh, maybe some connectivity issue. So we'll go to the other questions. Uh, okay. So now, uh, uh, you know, Albert Ibrahim asks, as you mentioned, IS code itself does not provide clear information. Please suggest reliable sources to get technical guidelines and working with lines. Sorry, could you repeat that question? Uh, so it's uh, it's basically <laughs> to ask about, ask about uh, the issue with IS code not giving reliable information, and hence asking where to where to get reliable information, technical gu guidelines to work online from. From me, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. So it is true. It is. It's. It's been frustrating for me as well because I didn't have any any starting point, um, uh, you know. And uh, I mean, so more, you know, th that was kind of uh, one whole chunk of my presentation was about not having that information. Um, um, so uh, well, I hope that M Lime can contribute in that direction. Streamline processes on site because that matters and that's the difference between people adopting a material and not adopting a material as i try to explain uh, you know that the value system and the, e the kind of real estate timeline pressures all of that so i i do hope that mlime can contribute and help in that direction and also i'm sure like other efforts uh, there are other efforts ar around the country which which can help you um uh, you know so it, it needs doing it needs doing for sure so some questions with which are about you know can it be used in bathrooms can it replace yeah. rcc those kind of questions again so some replacing rcc so again this is where i emphasize that lime has its own logic so it isn't about just uh, take the cement out put the lime in it isn't a quite it it has its own logic and uh, you know i see in udaipur for example 200 year old uh, buildings where they've used a system of bamboo and lime crete to span flat slabs no stone at all so uh, you know th there's a wealth of ideas already out there and there's a lot of scope for taking them as starting points and making them your own evolving them getting a bit of know how from engineers and carriers and bringing a, you know, I think what's important is again collaboration here, and uh, hundred percent. Uh, I think again, there's there's a big future for this, for material for developing research and relevant um, applications uh, in in lime. So yeah, you can't just swap out the lime and the cement, and you know, lime for example is not at all compatible with uh, steel, and um, uh, you know, because it's corrosive. Lime is highly alkaline and highly corrosive. So steel has almost no life when it is used with lime. So then there are other materials, for example, like GFRP, which I really wanted to use on my project, but then I decided to let that battle go. Um, but it is it is standard practice you know, to put steel girders wherever you need reinforcement. And, um, uh, you know, uh, so, so I'm just trying to say there's a lot of new materials out there, a lot of people working in pockets. That's the other thing I found. A lot of good work happening in small pockets that are not communicating with each other. And um, it would be great for universities and, you know, other platforms where, where this cross communication can happen would be great. Right. Thanks. So uh, Ishwarya wants to ask what protection does lime need from adverse environmental conditions and during application as well as in the long term? So alike, I mean, uh, lime has been used to build in all kinds of environmental conditions all over the world, all the way until the 50s. So uh, uh, it's very, it is site specific. And we have at MLime tried to streamline it a little bit. We do offer a little bit of help with specification and all that. So uh, it is it is very uh, site specific, just the way you know you would design a cement building, a cement based building as well. Your architectural detailing would matter. And uh, you know your specification would depend on um, 
on on the context on the geography even the cement is a highly homogenized material it still has a lot of difference and nuances across the country just simple simply based on availability of certain materials and so on for example in the mountains it's so hard to get um, you know burnt clay aggregates and so on so then how does one deal with that so there are there are there are it's just a matter of understanding essential fundamental chemistries and and then just you know uh, starting from first principles and designing your own specifications it's really uh, i i feel it's really not um, uh, you know it's ev everything can be done we just it, lime is a binder and the way the kind of technique and the kind of aggregate you use will completely change and modulate its behavior and properties so that everything is doable and it has been done also right all right so now there's there's a very i think a question that probably <laughs> you know tablid can maybe take up with you later in person but lots of questions with respect to uh how do we decide which one to consider what what kind of additives and materials to consider with respect to lime construction in the delhi region and uh, uh, when we constructed uh, this building from scratch can lime only be considered a material for construction uh, can lime only become the material for construction Absolutely. and estimated, estimated time and uh, that will take to get built and how how do we get the labor or craftsmen who are equipped in lime construction so these are of course the challenges that you've been talking about yes but just please if you can yeah be... i mean like i mentioned that uh, i uh... i think that one of the biggest challenges in working with lime if you were to follow uh, the absolute hardcore traditional uh, flow uh, would be that uh, um would would be getting reliable and uh, dependable workmen and craftsmanship and artisanship quality as well so in order to deal with that m lime offers ready ready you ready to use materials because i feel when you don't have to do diy processing on site number one the quality of the and the consistency of the raw material that you produce the binder is far better and number two you remove an entire burden from the construction worker from the lime worker which is that you have to sit and make your own lime like a cement worker you don't tell them to make your own cement right so they can then focus on what they need to do which is actually craft the mixes and you know apply it in your uh, building and yes absolutely lime should be considered a material for uh, building new build and in fact um, lime concretes and uh, footings with lime are absolutely uh, lovely ways to make sure that your building's moisture management lasts as long as you want as long as the building and that a few years you know what happens with things like cement is that contractors are gunning for their kind of uh, liability as well right so uh, with uh, you know the cement you always get initial hardness you always get initial set because it because of the nature of that material but it's only after one two three rains you start seeing where the flaws in the artisanship have been and um, uh so so uh with lime i highly suggest using it for moisture management to to the advantage of course finishes everybody loves lime finishes and um they are always always uh, one one way of incorporating lime in your building but to actually use its performance and its uh, um you know breathability its chemical free nature is is uh, going to really create a, a lovely habitat and a lovely building that ages gracefully as well and um how does one decide uh, i think the other part of the question is uh, how do we consider something for delhi so i think uh, um again i can like i said we do at m line like just to simplify life a little bit we do offer a few basic specifications and uh, always encourage uh, on site um, sampling um, so that you know exactly what you're getting into and uh, if not and sampling is often where we suggest you can take our crew for 3 to 5 days and they'll just demonstrate it to you otherwise we also offer field manuals so that people who are you know motivated enough to iterate themselves can do the same and um having said that i'm trying to i'm still saying that we try to narrow that scope of um scope of 
sort of exploration as much as possible so that the process is not frustrating and we keep i am constantly comparing the m lime workflow to cement workflow because that's the standard that we are used to that speed that kind of brainlessness that you just mix ek char milao and you're done right you don't have so we we constantly trying to create that same kind of um, uh, convenience and scalability with lime so um, yeah traditional methods are many and just for example plastering you can find 400 specifications just from rajasthan i'm sure but um, uh, but we we have streamlined it to what we think is uh, achievable and uh, least frustrating and high performing so that's that's how i put it right like i said we i feel free to pick and select what i want to take forward from traditional techniques including additives actually organic additives you are asking so in the uh, bichli haveli uh, and and what i realized through my little research and i think parvati had spoken about this as a really small research project as well which i would love to con- like be part of at some point is that a lot of these organic additives are basically different ways of introducing active ingredients active proteins carbohydrates alcohols into the mix so what is available in the form of jaggery over here will be you know date palm uh, this sugar in bengal and so on right so the go- again once we investigate just the way the essential chemistry of lime remains the same the essential chemistry even the way these additives work remains quite similar uh, is is what i uh, is 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 the way i look at it so the choice of organic additive so you know just the way when we want to harden cement we take a dhakkan of uh, fix it and we put it in right so that is the equivalent of what we are trying to accomplish with organic additives is give it that extra punch and in order to do that um, we use organic uh, additives because well that's the traditional practice so far but then there are german there's a german company called baukemi which is offering this in india as well they're offering kind of like a natural but mist you know a liquid which helps uh, again you put two dhakkans of it in your lime mix and you're good to go and they've repaired a lot of uh, lime uh, infrastructure using uh, you know this this additive so um, so so that same kind of thinking is coming in and it has been around in europe and uk us where which are more research minded uh, you know uh, this things uh, geography so this this thinking has been there and and same with selecting the organic additive is about which is the ingredient that i want to introduce it isn't about the methi or the babul itself it's about what do i want to do with my mix do i want to introduce a sugar do i want to introduce a resin so that that same logic i try to um, apply when when working with any any kind of construction material right i hope that helps <laughs> right so another question about arish in detail i think uh, maybe we need another session for that <laughs> yeah it's a lovely polished lime finish you can use it in the interior exterior floors everywhere and it's breathable so it's lovely it's uh, do not use plastic paint after you do lime plasters that would that would not make a lot of sense that would be that would uh, invalidate the entire breathability that you have generated with your building so lovely thing about arish is that it's very hard to touch very sensual to touch and yet absolutely breathable which means that it will not allow water to get trapped inside your building and and lots of other benefits for your structure and um yeah and of course it's a sensual beautiful finish i mean lime finishes are very seductive there is no uh, you know I, i think nobody will really dispute that and lime also uh, one of the things i love about personally about lime finishes is that they age very gracefully as well they never offend the eye and um, even if you are a new let's say you've just literally your local crew has just literally taken an on site training you know this week and next week they're doing it on your site and they're doing some kind of a polished lime finish on your side it may not be you know it may be a 70% version of what they were what let's say a, a more seasoned uh, artisan does yet lime always looks beautiful because it's a natural material it'll never look if if there are any major issues like it has to fall off and it's delaminating from the substrate the, those issues you will see immediately 
so there's no uh, as an as a as a as an architect or a homeowner or a project patron there's no ten you can really uh, sort of count on line to either work or fail right in front of your eyes you're not going to have a problem if it's holding up well now and if it's curing well and you will get what you sort of see with line and and that's also one one aspect that helps in uh, you know for us to do crew trainings confidently is because you will immediately know if there's a problem even if your crew hasn't done a raish before in their life and they learned it last week hmm and in fact it's really funny it's very unexpected for me because i'm so used to polished lime but we are finding that a lot of our projects and customers actually like semi polished lime better so less polished lime less labor intensive uh, they they're finding it aesthetically more uh, pleasing for their spaces so um, which which was kind of surprising for uh, for me right So, uh, another question about: Is it available? Uh, M line service available in Tamil Nadu? And if yes, Tamil speaking. Everywhere, services. everywhere, everywhere where I can convince our crew to travel, <laughs> and you can take care of them, they are available. They are. We don't have a Tamil speaking resource person, but I would love it if you can offer us one, and we can work with you on that. and that would be amazing that would really because uh, in my own little journey so far i found language to be such a barrier even between mewar and marwar you know jodhpur and udaipur so uh, i i would really love to uh, sort of be able to collaborate on on uh, something like that right so i think a question from swati neki who talks about practitioners uh, mixing lim cement and lime in the plaster mix Yeah so I think that was a big trend and I even tried to show in my uh, presentation some examples but now I think though pretty much the entire conservation and the entire community that uses lime which is largely the restoration community today including uh, you know the restoration community in Europe I think everybody has come to realize that their lime and cement just kind of fight with each other and there's no value in using a lime with cement and also this is a uh it's actually counterproductive and this is exactly uh kind of reflective of the loss of faith that people had had in in lime and the faith that they place in cement you know that cement will solve all our problems lime is slow lime is uh, uh weak these are all not true and they are all solvable problems and if you have high performing lime then you know you you don't need anything else right so lots of more questions here so somebody is talking about uh, ashumi asks how about cost effectiveness it's expensive so uh... right so um, right cement as you all probably know is manufactured in massive industries massive factories and the consumption is massive as well so i imagine when lime is used at that scale it will be far cheaper than cement but even now as it stands like if i had to compare m line fat line prices to uh, you know cement uh, based practices a lot of it works out quite well of course if you go for something like polish lime which is a highly artisanal labor intensive which is a, a not highly labor intensive but yeah i mean so then you have to compare it to a premium line finish as a to a premium equivalent you know i don't know texture the paint or whatever equivalent that there would be in the market but uh, in fact sometimes lime plasters come out cheaper because a lot of our customers are actually keeping the lime plaster exposed in the interior space because they just like the way it looks so they're not even in, so you know that lime plaster is doing the job of a cement plaster plus a basic uh, birla putti plus a basic basic three coats of paint and primer right that entire set of six processes gets replaced by one lime plaster and in those cases it works out much cheaper also and then of course like i'm saying to judge a material you need to judge it on its own terms so i always tell customers if you don't want to you know straight away just like plunge into lime just use lime masonry on your west facing or south facing uh, building envelopes where you get a lot of uh, direct radiation 
because especially like in hot climates so just just do a few you know like for example another thing that people spend a lot of money on is terracing right waterproofing and then you do like a kota stone flooring or something at the very uh, minimum but compared to that lime concrete is cheaper you're not putting because the cost of putting you know, stone is actually uh, even a basic kota stone is very uh, you know so so it's very contextual and even the way you measure if if you are going to do masonry with lime the benefit across the life cycle of the building is is how you'd have to measure the success and the value of any material so and yes the upfront in, in investment does not have to be too much okay so now uh, should we also ask that does m line work for mortars also or only for plaster yeah 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 of course we make we make a binder and a high quality which we believe is high quality high performing binder and frankly i've been uh, it is only now that i have the confidence to take up lime concrete and flat roof work on my a uh, flat roof repair in my own prop building because this is uh, i'm sure as uh, all the conservation practitioners have experienced repairing lime concrete is absolutely essential to dry climate flat roofed buildings like ours here in rajasthan and almost an extinct art and um, very hard to accomplish with you know even the slightest uh, you know sort of gap in the kind of material quality you have so um uh, so, so so yeah um right so uh, harleen wants to ask if uh, how how to go about lime flooring uh, you know what is the scope and how to go about lime flooring so i think that maybe yeah there's, yeah <laughs> there's lime concrete there's polished lime which i these are the two that i uh, would sort of go with and uh, we've also we're in the process of developing a wax that can help again like um for example with the wax it's not a traditional indian idea because uh, but we've taken it from because we never had toilets inside the house culturally so we never needed our lime to um, you know perform that function however um and not just that frankly we did have terraces that received the rain but um, the, the quality of polished lime that was possible 100 200 300 years ago is very different to what we accomplish now so uh, we are developing a wax to help that and again we're taking ideas from venetian and moroccan waxes and i'm always freely borrowing ideas uh, whether it's with pigments traditionally in rajasthan it's all white so usually you know even old seasoned ta old timer karigars when they come to us for the first two three days we are just engaging with them trying to let them know that there are possibilities of change and you know trying to just open their mind to that yes this is a traditional practice but we are and we are not we are not introducing chemicals we are not introducing anything against the nature of lime lime is still the hero lime is still what is performing but there are ways to manipulate it to make it uh, more relevant and appealing to our current uh, architectural and construction practices so that is that's a big you know like for example developing a color library and our hope is that by the end of the year we have an a precise color library just the way one expects from like asian paints or whatever so uh, you know th those things i hope will uh, you know make the material more accessible right uh, so the other question on uh, the environmental impact on lime sources so how is it sourced and you know that kind of a thing so is that a long term issue yeah you know quarry? of course like we do quarry mountains we do quarry the aravalli so it's like a uh, that's a very relevant question and i hope that um, we can address it the only the, the the one big comfort we do have is that um um that lime is recyclable but uh, that that is definitely a huge investigation that one should be conducting and the other thing is uh, interestingly cement and lime are both made from limestone just their manufacturing processes are different and certain types of limestones are different so um yeah that's absolutely something to consider for the future so i think lots of uh, other questions and uh, you know 
queries and you know uh, somebody's asking about pigments in a rice plaster then there's establishing uh, another enterprise is david versus goliath like <laughs> never <laughs> so you would have taken the easier okay. so i think lots of more questions but i'm so sorry that we are out of time and I'm, but at the same time very excited that we have created this dialogue through which you know a lot of people can bring up these questions you know honestly and frankly and not ashamed of bringing up all kinds of questions and yeah, uh, yeah so so uh, also you know uh, uh, i think uh, from the entire presentation you know the, this is of course the tip of the iceberg and everything can't be discussed and covered in an hour session and so malvika certainly recommended that we should uh, look at these possibilities of the workshops you know 3 to 5 day workshops with artisans that you know uh, we can uh, learn from and, uh, and engage with the material in in much more depth but uh, uh, i think overall from this presentation what's uh, fantastic to see is that uh you know there we don't have all the answers number one and uh, and i think malvika has tried to uh, you know pose these very interesting questions that she has had the luxury of i think working over years with this material and she is happy to share the information so i think that's where we have a great opportunity there and um, to be able to work with the material intensively of course there are organizations you know larger firms and organizations and governmental bodies also who may be working but then there is a lack of accessibility somewhere some somehow you know to that information to the common architect you know the the engineer and the architect are still struggling with you know how do we really take this forward and okay we can romanticize about it but really can we really think of it as a material for the future <laughs> so i think so happy to see that you've asked all the re re these questions and you've tried to be uh, you know so uh, uh, experimental in your approach towards uh, and honest in your approach towards questioning this idea of romanticizing the local and romanticizing always this traditional knowledge and yeah. leaving it there so i think that's where you know we have to break that divide and you know bring it into mainstream and hence these these aspects of uh, of course it's a contradiction i feel that on one hand we are talking about uh, standardization and on the other hand we are, we are glamorizing the idea of uh, we have been glamorizing the idea of the local so that contradiction has been uh, brought in very very uh, well brought in by you malvika so thanks to that and uh, and i think uh, uh, malvika will be happy to connect with any of you you know who uh, be yeah so yeah i did drop my email address um, at the end of the presentation so otherwise uh, yeah i can i think you can find me off google or something so right yeah. so um, yeah so thank you so much again and uh, really really think that lots of our students and lots of these people who are here today will be inspired to take this experimentation and exploration forward malvika so thanks for inspiring us all <laughs> okay. my absolute privilege thank you so much for having me thank you all right thank you all right thank you okay bye bye thank you